The biggest challenge to TV news is the alternative ways to receive news. How do I get it in your phone? How do I get you to DVR it? How do I get it so that it's easy for you to watch on your iPad? In the case of the internet, for the first time, we have a platform that allows people to catch up on television that they hadn't done in the past. One of the purposes of popular culture is to let people know they are not alone and to see yourself reflected in something truthfully. How do you watch TV today? In your living room or on a tablet or a smartphone? What will the next generation of television bring? Tonight on the Aspen Institute Presents, we'll hear from some of TV's innovators and programmers about how television has changed in our lifetimes and where it will go next. Hi, I'm John Stewart from the BBC, on location at the 2013 Aspen Ideas Festival here in Aspen, Colorado. Every year, the Ideas Festival takes on issues that affect all our lives. And among the many topics at this year's festival, the reinvention of television is up for discussion by the people who bring programming to our homes, our tablets, and our smartphones. First up, can TV news continue to compete with online news sites and social media? I'm gonna open, I have a, a anecdotal lead, which I'm gonna to use to cue up a comment from uh, Bob Barnett. So how many of you followed the Wendy Davis filibuster two nights ago in Texas? How many of you followed that on TV? Anybody holding up a hand is lying because it wasn't on TV. It was, it was to, to the best of my knowledge, and you can contradict, I, I may have, there may be something I, I didn't catch, but I believe this was a Twitter-only phenomenon where you had this state senator from Fort Worth, I believe, a Democratic woman, a very dynamic woman who decided to run out the clock against a, the, a very tough anti-abortion bill in the Texas State Senate. Uh, the legislator had to adjourn at midnight, and she kept the floor for 11 plus hours, and the audience on Twitter grew like this. But to the best of my knowledge, not CNN, not MSNBC, not Fox, not any other TV network <clears throat> carried this news. You could think of this as the first genuine news event that happened outside the ken of TV. So the question is, what does this betoken for TV news? Is this a sign of how there's going to be just of ways in which it has to adapt, of things it's not able to do, things it'll have to do better, et cetera? I turn to you, Robert Barnett, to give us our, our talking points, our, a debater's brief, if you would, on why you think that there are challenges for TV news, then we'll hear from other panelists how they're gonna to respond to them. I've got about 350 clients in this business, correspondents, producers, executives, et cetera. Uh, and so it's given me the opportunity to not be a participant in it, but to observe it from close range. I think the, I think the biggest challenge to TV news is the alternative ways to receive news, the internet obviously being one, the comedy news shows being another. Uh, so many young people get their news now by seeing what they're making fun of. And that's an interesting way to get your news. There is a generational divide. I think that the uh, evening news shows, the traditional evening news shows, face great challenges. I think that the demise or modification of the magazine shows, as evidenced most recently by the closing of Rock Center, is another indication of the challenges that TV news faces. The morning show wars, the proliferation of morning shows, the diversification of morning shows, which is where the money is, is another challenge that's faced. I'm optimistic, though, because I think while broadcast media and broadcast news tends to shrink, cable news, as evidenced by EHOB and some other things that we're talking about today, I'm sure, will give us more choices and more opportunities to hear views and to hear the news. And I think what EHOB's doing and what Nadugo Benga is doing, the Nigerian who has Arise TV, and others bringing new options to us will be an exciting way that television news will continue, but I don't think it will continue to be the same news that I watched and the names that you mentioned brought us in the past. Right, so we have a special, perhaps a particularly acute case of the general fragmentation of the news environment over the last 20 or 30 years, and none of you is really in a complete, none of you is aspiring to the role 
that uh, Huntley and Brinkley once had, or Walter Cronkite. There's different parts of it, but I'm curious how you respond to these challenges. Let's start with you, uh, Hari, that, that while uh, the, the news hour is not a broad-based uh, uh, program the way that the NBC Nightly News aspires to be, what does this new environment mean for the opportunities you have, the things you wouldn't like to change but you have to, and the opportunities you can pursue? Well, I think, for example, um, as you mentioned uh, a couple of nights ago in Texas, that was actually a huge missed opportunity by the networks because it was the Texas Tribune that had the live stream of the events that were happening in Texas. So a huge amount of the Twitter conversation was actually informed by the primary source, which was none of the networks. Right? We don't have a, a, a satellite that can interrupt all PBS programming and give you that for three hours or four hours. You probably might not find that as interesting anyway. So I think that there was an opportunity there for someone else to pick up the ball and say, if the networks aren't going to do it, we will. So at this point, I, I don't perceive my competitors to be just the cable news networks or the broadcast networks. I perceive them to be anybody that has the capability to put video on the web and bring it to people in the way that's most relevant and convenient to them. So I, you know, even though I work in a broadcast um, and I'm happy to do so, I don't know anybody in my generation and peer group that shows up at night at six o'clock and has the time and the luxury to watch a television program like we've prepared. So I think for me, you know, my challenge is to figure out how do I create both a lean back and a lean forward, not in the MSNBC terms, but lean back and a lean forward experience where if you want, you can customize a playlist and choose your own ingredients and stack your own newscast. Or if you want, and if you trust me to sort of curate what happened in the world today, I can give you that as well. But I really think that my challenge is to figure out how do I get it in your phone? How do I get you to DVR it? How do I get it so that it's easy for you to watch on your iPad wherever you are, whenever you are? Because I know that I'm going to lose that fight in competing with your time at 6 o'clock at night. And just to follow up one point about that, you work for a non-commercial network, although it needs underwriters. Do you think you have, is there any significant way in which you have an easier time than if you're working at ABC or NBC now? We have less money, so <laughs> I guess that's easier, right? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, but I think that it's, it's, it's much more difficult sometimes for a very large institution to pivot very quickly. I mean, I was there in, at ABC in 2004 to 2007, and it was really the, Peter Jennings' thrust to try to get a digital channel on the air at that time, ABC News Now, where I kind of started. And it was his just sheer 800-pound guerrilla force that said, I want to do the conventions wall to wall. Let's build a channel to make this happen, and let's keep it going. So that said, I mean, ABC has huge resources to publish online in a way that I can't at the moment. And... It's just about whether they're capitalizing on that opportunity or not. I think that we're smaller, we're more agile, and I think that we can compete faster in the internet space than perhaps a large institution can. We just don't have the resources of, I mean, MSNBC has a fantastic website, and there's a lot of people that it takes to make that happen. So there's certain things that we can compete on and certain things that we can't. I'm going to ask you now, uh, Yab al-Shahabi, you're opening up a new TV news network at a time where we're hearing that the landscape is uh, stony in many ways. Why is this a good time to open up a network, and why do you think you can succeed or make a difference? Sure. I mean, <clears throat> number one, I just need to make sure that I'm opening Al Jazeera America. It's going to be American channel for the American audience. Now, I'm not opening a channel to be the normal channel because I strongly believe that the current model for the TV, for the linear programming compared to digital, is not sustainable. So I'm opening a channel for the 21st century. And let's talk a little bit from research perspective. We have conducted ex extensive research nationwide with the huge sample. And the research indicate that the root cause is not because people are moving to digital or moving to linear programming. The root cause, what people need, 50 million, roughly around 40 million of Americans, they want in-depth, informative, journalism that matter most to them. That's really the root cause why people is going to Twitter and digital, because they are not getting what they want from the linear programming. They are not getting the depth, the informative, they are getting infotainment. So I just need to make sure the chain between the Twitter to have a breaking news, to go to di digital to have a little bit more news, and then I would like to go for the TV to have 
detailed informative factors. So number one is, I think if we follow the model of the 21st century, where let the TV, the linear programming, be in-depth, the reference for detailed information, fact-based, and bias, a lot of people, the 50 million will say, we're gonna stick with the TV, that's number one. Number two, what the research indicated that the new model, the new operating model in the news on the linear programming and the TV, they want interactive. They need full conversion. They need a channel to be born with full conversion. It's not first I, I launch TV and then it's good to have digital and then it's good to have Twitter. No, they need to have full, fully integrated, converted, where they can go for breaking news and then they can go back for detailed, informative information. The other things where I just need to make sure the new digital world will allow the American audience to be really interacting with the executive producers and producers before the launch of the program, during the planning stage. Because at the end, you need to have the, the demand of the audience, the need of the audience, and this is where the digital platform and the TV play interact together at the planning stage. And then after that, when you have a program, you still have an interactive, a two-way communications between the audience and between the executive producers to be able to enrich the content of the TV. So you ask me in simple, why now? Research indicated there is a huge need for in-depth, informative, fact-based, and bias. See what is the industry now. Opinionated news, breaking news, focusing more on celebrity and politicians. Where is the mainstream sitting on that? Where is the community information sitting on that? I now on the process of opening 12 bureaus during the launch. Why? I need original content from the community, from domestic news. There is a great news happening in Denver. There is a great news happening in Chattanooga. There is a great news happening in everywhere in the United States. Not just bad news, there is a great news that will motivate the American audience as well as there is an issues that matter to the American audience. So that's number one, the research indicated. The research indicated only they want one-stop shop to be able to have news around the block and also to have news around the globe in an interconnected way that reflect the lifestyle and the issues and translate these issues to the American audience. Thank you. So, so for this first round, I want to ask now, uh, Larry O'Donnell, that, that you, for your general, you've just heard an argument that what the American public really wants in research shows is in-depth, serious news, which would suggest a return to sort of some of a golden age of American television. You've been involved very closely, and you're, you're identified with, with a network whose success would seem to, to <coughs> suggest not, not a moving away from, from in-depth reporting, but a uh, a, very, a particular uh, political um, perspective that part of MS NBC's success in the last couple of years has been responding to what Fox de demonstrated. Uh, how do you think, wh what's the role of TV news? How do you respond to the idea that we really need more uh, in-depth information and versus the fragmentation of the networks? Um, I think if you did a survey of the 300 million Americans, Somewhere close to 50 million of them would tell you they would like to read the complete works of Shakespeare. They won't. If I put it on their desk in front of them every single page, they won't. Uh, and I, for one, uh, am unimpressed by the research result that there's 50 million out there who want to watch something called in-depth TV news because they're, it's being offered to them all the time. It's being offered every night on PBS, on the news hour, every night. Those are serious and protracted conversations that do not require interruptions because they're so short. Uh, the time periods are so short. Charlie Rose does it every night. Uh, and every time you put on a PBS frontline documentary, I can guarantee you that those 50 million people will find something else to do because they always do. Uh, and if you could actually deliver five million of those people to a serious hour-long documentary. Uh, that's what NBC News would have done with the uh, 30 Rock Space and all the other uh, 
spaces that they're struggling with uh, now. I mean, you know, NBC primetime is in big trouble. And the last time, cyclically, that they got in really big trouble was in the 90s. And their answer to that was to take Dateline, which was their version of 60 Minutes, which was one night a week, and they ended up putting it on four nights a week uh, with Stone Phillips, who became the biggest TV star in America because he was on more than anybody else <laughs> in the country. But so um, this 50 million is, is they're, they're, they're uncorrallable. They are uh, smart people with a lot of other interests. Uh, they will sneak out to the ballet or bowling or all sorts of other things when you are offering them this time-specific, in-depth news that they then won't watch. Uh, and so there's that. But, uh, and oh, by the way, for Texas legislators, if you're going to do a filibuster that goes after 11 p.m. Eastern, <laughs> I'm sorry. You don't get live for that. But even on, on uh, cable they news? Should, all their rules should be on these legislatures around the country. It should all be that the legislative day expires at 11 p.m. <laughs> Eastern, no matter what time zone you're in, if you want to get that kind of wonderful yeah. stuff on. I mean, I did, I was, you know, I'm the last live hour, 10 to 11, and I showed her for a couple of minutes, uh, you know, uh, we cut into it and said, hey, she's doing this thing, this is interesting, let's see how it goes. Uh, but, and then the next night, uh, when people were actually watching again, and I, by the way, I think if we'd gone live to it, uh, we would have gotten nothing. It would have just fallen right off a cliff. People go to sleep. I mean, that's the thing you have to remember. Uh, people do go to sleep in America, so they don't tend to watch Texas filibusters at midnight uh, <laughs> Eastern. And, uh, but she was the big star of MSNBC and CNN mm -hmm. you know, the next night at 8 p.m. when people really are watching. Uh, so she got her shot. And what, what MSNBC is, what I, what I think cable news primetime has become uh, in, the, in the shows that get the ratings, is uh, it's the op-ed page of the newspaper. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Uh, and there's an awful lot of news uh, in, the, in the newspaper, but everybody knows in the New York Times where to go to find out what Krugman thinks, to find out uh, you know, what Maureen Dowd thinks. To find, everybody knows what that is, and they know why it's on a different page, and they know why it's at the same place every day. Everybody gets that. And that's exactly what primetime cable is, uh, certainly Fox and MSNBC. And by the way, it's why uh, the CNN doesn't have as good a business in primetime as Fox and MSNBC does. Because at that point, you know, when you get to 9 o'clock at night in America, there's nobody, there's nobody who would ever find their way to cable news who doesn't already know every single thing that happened. And what they're doing with their remote is they're going, I want to see what O'Reilly thinks about this. I want to see what Rachel thinks about this. That's what they're doing. They're going to the op-ed piece. They know who Krugman is. They know the way he thinks about other things, but they want to find out what he thinks about this latest thing. And there's a new thing that happened today, and I don't yet know what Rachel thinks about it, so I'm going to turn it on at 9 o'clock and find out. In cable news in prime time, if you don't have a program that provokes the question, you know, what does O'Reilly think? What does Hannity think? What does Rachel think? Then that program will never, ever, ever, over time, get as big a rating as the programs that have, that, that have both the provocation of that question and the answer to it. You know, you turn on uh, Bill O'Reilly at 8 o'clock, you find out what he thinks. Uh, so, yes, Bob, yeah. Uh, so, I, I, I want to make two points. First, there is a passionate and very big consumer audience that advertisers love for serious in-depth coverage, and its name is 60 Minutes, yep. which always, almost always rates in the top 10 yep. entertainment or news, mm -hmm. and there's CBS Sunday Morning which I personally think is the best show on television. <laughs> but I dare say a whole lot of you think so too. Second point I would make is, there is a hunger for serious, nonpartisan, in-depth coverage when this country is challenged in one way or another, for good or for bad. And it's why CNN often wins against its competitors when there's a Boston bombing or God help us 9-11 or whatever. So I think there is an audience for it, and I personally admire what Ehab's trying to do. I hope he succeeds. We'll see. But I, I don't know if it's 50 million or if it's 5 million, but 5 million is a pretty good rating. Yes. Can I just add, I mean, <clears throat> of course, he compared me with PBS. 
uh, let me just, you know, we can go through analysis. <laughs> you know what I mean? We can go through the analysis of CNN and Fox and etc. which is, I'm not going to go through that comparison. But the reality is, let me give you a story of Haiti. You know, let's go through the American channel. And Haiti is tragedy. It's a human side of the story. And look of how many news channels they did the breaking news, but how many news channels stay after the fact? For six months. I will tell you something. If you look to what Al Jazeera did, and this is something not to promote, we won a fantastic award on this one. We stayed six to eight months after the breaking news of Haiti. I will challenge you, will challenge everybody to tell me how many of these news channels stayed for six months to cover the human side of the story. It is a difference between covering breaking news and let people inform about there is a disaster happening in Haiti versus to look to the angle of the human side of Haiti. Inform the government, inform the official, inform the politicians, inform the mainstream that there is a human crisis that needs support, that needs help. There is people has to make key decisions about this one. This is what we are saying about the depth of the news, fact-based, real news, looking at the human angle of this story. Plus, in addition to that, don't miss how many of these news channels invest on the investigative journalism side. How are you going to get a true story? How are you going to get a real story if you don't invest heavily on the channel of a 21st century with emphasis on the investigative journalism? It's not about celebrity. It's not about talent. The story, the talent, honestly, it is about the news itself. And in fairness, I think you're not saying this is unimportant. You're saying there's not a giant audience for it. I'm saying uh, the American television viewer that has that remote and has access now to hun literally hundreds <coughs> of channels has made hundreds of decisions every night uh, to choose a away from exactly this thing that everybody here wants them to choose. And you... And it's available to them. I mean, what should never, ever be forgotten is just because you didn't see that in-depth thing that you want to see on the Today Show today, you know, or on my show, PBS is doing it every yeah. night. NewsHour does it every night. And every discussion, I'm so glad NewsHour is here because every discussion I've ever participated in, uh, in this area, in this subject, always forgets that PBS exists, always forgets what NewsHour is doing. And what is also forgotten is how many people are choosing, freely choosing, not to watch NewsHour, to not do it. And, and so we've, we're running the market test every single night. And, and the reason networks leave, you know, at some point after the disaster, the sun sets on the disaster, is that the viewers go away. They will stay there. They would stay in Haiti for a couple of years if the viewers would keep watching it in the 13th or the 19th or the 47th day. So they, all they're doing, if, whenever you see commercials on television, whenever you're watching television and there's commercials, that determines what that television does, whether it's in the entertainment section, whether it's in the news section, the sports section, whatever it is. The commercials are driven by ratings. Ratings is a measurement of audience. The audience tells those channels with commercials what they want to watch. And the people uh, running those channels go, OK, I get the message. We're leaving Haiti now. We're, we're going back here. I think you know, what, what he's saying is, is pretty important in the sense that um, there's a supply and demand and an economics at work um, because we know basically what, get rating, what gets ratings and what's going to drive viewership. And I think for a non-commercial audience like ours, we have the luxury of time. We have the luxury to bring you a story about what the hell the violence was in Burma right now, why the Buddhist monks are actually taking violent actions against the Muslims there. Look it up. It's on our site. But it's, it's really, I mean, that's to, not to say that I, I absolutely uh, agree that I'm, I'm glad that Al Jazeera is making this investment. Um, frankly, them and CCTV are the only ones with deep enough pockets to have bureaus all over the planet right now. Right. When I worked at both the networks, primarily the bureaus were New York, LA, and then you'd have a you know, guy like me standing in tornadoes in Texas, and maybe in Florida, and, and per perhaps Atlanta, <coughs> and then the world was covered by the London office, right? So that's it. And so here are these other networks wanting to have the Global South coverage when 
uh, when uh, Hugo Chavez uh, was pronounced dead. Al Jazeera was on my computer with a reporter there within five minutes because he lived there in Caracas and I was impressed, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm happy that there's original content that's being created elsewhere, but really, I mean, when you start looking at on commercial television, television what's happening today, it's, it's much more difficult to try to say to the viewer, really come to us, we're giving you this substantive conversation. I mean, there's a, there's a line that, uh, I think it was the movie Gladiator that said, you know, the true power of Rome lies not in the marble floors of the Senate, but in the sands of the Colosseum. Right, so right now the Colosseum is extended into our living rooms and the up and down arrow of whether this gladiator should live or die is happening with the remote control. And there are more people watching the election of American Idol than they are of the president. Right? I mean, it's, it's a tragedy that we're, if as many of you watch the news hour as say you do, we would never have a funding crisis. How, how, many, so, so how many watch? In a typical news hour yeah. night, what is the audience? Uh, probably about a million. Yeah. So how many people here actually, I actually watch it, I record it on TiVo and watch it when <laughs> doing exercise every night because when yes. we moved back from China, it was the only TV news worth watching. I think. Right. So, it, and so now, you know, we've, we've, we're, on, uh, we're on live stream during the day. We have a YouTube channel that actually gets far more international viewership than we ever imagined because it's accessible and it's ready for people. It's embeddable, it's shareable, uh, as our, our online video is from overseas. And so there are people that, you know, literally say, I build a playlist and I watch your newscast and I'm in Japan because this is what I want. And so that's fantastic, I'm glad. But then I look at the American audience and I say, well, great. I mean, I'm, I'm producing this stuff, hopefully, for someone down the street. I mean, you know, there was somebody that asked me the other day, like, are you getting recognized at Aspen? I said, I work at PBS. My anonymity <laughs> is relatively safe, <laughs> right? So it's, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna have a, a weekend broadcast and I'm telling you that, again, I understand that six o'clock on Saturday night is gonna be a tough sell for my friends, but I'm gonna try to figure out how do I get this content in front of those people that I want to be watching wherever and whenever they want it. And I won't sleep on TV. I don't think TV is dead. I don't think the internet's gonna kill TV or anything like that. These are all sort of supplementary platforms. But I think we have a responsibility in this day and age <coughs> to make sure that you know, we spend 15 to 20% thinking about the distribution and the reach after the story is done because we're competing with everything. Television news, like all of television, has come a long way. But where will TV go next? In our next session, we'll hear how new technologies, trends, and innovations are reshaping the global entertainment industry. The, when I think about Twitter and TV, we like to think of, of Twitter as a, as a force multiplier for, um, for media. What I mean by that is, um, actually you can think of it in the terms of, of Newton's second law, you know, where the force equals uh, uh, the, the mass of the, of the piece of media uh, and uh, times acceleration. And I really think of, you know, if you think of, uh, of Game of Thrones is on at 8 p.m. and you've got this, this piece of media there, that Twitter acts as an accelerant on that. And the conversation around it um, really uh, is a force multiplier to media. In fact, we even see um, we even see the conversation on Twitter about uh, a program um, extend hours after the program has ended. There will be sort of an increase in conversation about it while the program is on air. And then for hours after the program has gone off, there's this continuing conversation about it um, that really helps sort of pull, pull other people into it into the conversation, pull other people into the program, and extend the relationship between the show and the people watching it. That's great. So Julius, um, when you were um, in your previous job at the FCC, how did you think about connected TV devices and stuff, which are these TVs that, most of us think of TV as just a box where you hook it up to a cable and there's our TV, but connected TVs are these devices that are connected to the internet. Um, last year, 2012, they sold about 200 million of these connected TVs around the world, and they expect to have 600 million connected TVs by 2017. And if they get that number, that'll be about 22% of all television sets will be connected to the internet, where they can watch streaming as well as broadcast. How do you think about that, and what was the policies well, you were? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a great question, because the incredibly cool things that Michael and Dick and others are doing um, all depend on uh, an infrastructure there that will allow for high speed, high capacity transmission uh, in both wired and wireless. Uh, video obviously is much more demanding than non-video. 
And we're in a pretty good place right now as a country, right? We've gone on mobile from being behind the rest of the world to leading the rest of the world with 4G, LTE, and uh, the incredible devices and apps that we have in the United States now. On the wired side, um, lots of progress. We've doubled speeds in the US in the last four years, gone from 20th worldwide to eighth in terms of our speeds, and the trajectories are good. This is all really important, and I think uh, not everyone has to continue to pay attention to this, but I'll tell you that if we don't, as a country, keep paying attention to this, then we'll, we'll, we'll freeze up uh, the innovators who are planning ahead for faster and faster speeds and planning for things like interconnected TVs everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's coming. Uh, every TV will be connected to the internet. Uh, that and the intelligence, whether it's in boxes or in TVs, will change the experience dramatically. Uh, there's three things that we need to focus on from a policy perspective to make sure this happens. One is the continued focus on speed and capacity, wired and wireless. The second is competition uh, at all the different levels, you know, being concerned about gatekeepers or insufficient competition. And the third is the openness of the internet. You know, uh, an internet connected TV uh, has uh, less value if it's a closed platform and anyone with uh, an idea, video or otherwise, can't get access to it. Got it. Michael, how do you think about competition in this world that's changing where, I mean, you run your, these television networks around the world. Are these television networks at risk at all or under threat by the internet or how, how do you view it? Um, well, we sort of sit on both sides of the equation. So on the one side of the equation, we run these television networks, which in many of the markets, India is a good example. The, the internet, high speed internet has not shown up to the point where we really do have competition. Mm -hmm. um, that's more in a place like Western Europe or, or obviously the United States. But where there is, you obviously have to be, you're constantly debating this, do we just want to be a conventional network or do we actually want to do something um, on the internet as well with the network? The other side to it though is that all of a sudden we have all of these buyers for our product that we didn't have in the past. Right. So let's take the UK as a really good example. The UK, up until about three years ago, Really, there was just Sky if you wanted to sell your movies um, into that market. And every three years, you'd show up at Sky, and they would knock you back. And they'd say, we're the only buyer, so it's us or nobody. Now that uh, Netflix is in the market and Amazon is in the market with Love Film, you all of a sudden actually have a competitive marketplace for your product mm -hmm. again. Um, and as a result, it's, it's a very good time to be a seller of movies and television shows for that matter all over the world because you have these new networks coming on as a result of this high speed internet that, that's, that's great being discussed now dick does, does twitter help these shows measure engagement i mean around the world as as, yeah. as, as he's now got product yeah. that he's got to think about the global audience can you help him by saying hey look here's where Look, look what's happening in your country with Twitter conversations. There are a couple interesting things I would say. One of the interesting things is that with some of these over-the-top programs like House of Cards, when I talked about Twitter being a force multiplier, I think that um, it's fascinating to note that since there wasn't a moment where it premiered, you know, like a Game of Thrones, that the first run is on at 8 p.m. Sunday night, etc., there's no point in time that everyone sort of gathers together to converse about it. So you don't get that of course, it was, it was an incredible success, but there wasn't a lot of conversation about it because you, know, you watch it and then your attention in the, in the time after you watch it, you might, you might say something about it, but if no one else is watching it at that time, the, there's no sort of, um, you know, the conversation doesn't bubble up. So I think it would be interesting for you know, folks working on things like those, those sorts of programs, House of Cards, to at least have a sort of a, uh, you know, like the arrested development to here at this point in time, we're gonna release it and there's a moment that they can all start to talk about it and uh, drive conversation. For those programs that do have uh, a, a, a point in time that they're on, like a Game of Thrones or a Pretty Little Liars, et cetera, or a sporting event, um, we absolutely help those guys uh, measure engagement. In fact, we just, we, we just uh, announced a relationship with Nielsen where Nielsen will now take the data from Twitter and use their methodology to create a Twitter TV rating um, so that, that, that it will create this sort of, we've, we've known for a while what the number, what the share was for the show, what the viewers looked like for the show. Now we'll see a sort of a 3D view of that. Here's the viewership for the show, and here's the depth of conversation about that program online. So I think that will be helpful, again, to the broadcasters who are trying to understand and measure um, the, um, 
the volume of engagement around their shows. There are definitely some shows whose ratings may be uh, lighter than another show in that time slot, but for whom the, the passion that the viewers have for it is so strong on Twitter that there's this story they can tell to their marketers that like our audience may be a little bit smaller, but it's incredibly engaged and passionate and that should have value for you. The f right now on the 200 million Connect TVs, the first app that's number one for people watch is YouTube. Number two is Netflix. And number three is a music app called Pandora. Mm -hmm. Pandora Radio is huge on this. Mm -hmm. So connected televisions now are also the place people want to listen to music in their living rooms. Uh, it's and actually, the number one thing they watch on YouTube is Vivo, right? Which is music videos, right? So finally, the music companies got smart after the empty. And this was Doug Morris who actually had the thought of it. They got smart after MTV and said, "Oh, let's not just give the video away to a cable network and make a, allow them to make all the money. Let's actually hang on to it, make our own cable network." And they did it with Vivo. And it's, I think, at this point, it's pretty much the largest traffic driver on YouTube. In five years. We have more television, more content, or same or less. Well, I'll tell, I'll tell you the fascinating thing to me. I've been hearing about the, you know, in the technology industry, I've been hearing about the death of television for going on 10 years now, and it's never been better. Um, I mean, the quality uh, and, and breadth of programming these days is just remarkable. And so I think that there's going to be, you will continue to hear that, dis that kind of discussion, but in my mind, it's getting, it's getting there's, there's more of it and it's better. So I don't see that trend stopping anytime soon. Michael? Um, I think it's a, it, it, so a couple of things. First of all, and we were talking about this before the panel, I think this, the, 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 the television and film and music too, but television and film in particular have always um, had been enormously affected by technology. Um, and film in particular, every sort of seven or eight years, a new technology has come along that has dramatically affected the economics of our business, whether it's pay television or DVDs or something like this. In the case of the internet and in the case of DVRs, but the internet as it relates to things like Netflix, for the first time, we have a platform that allows people to catch up on television that they hadn't done in the past. And I think what has resulted is an enormous improvement in the quality of television. Why? Because you can have these open-ended dramas mm which you couldn't have in the past because you, you missed an episode of The Wire and that was it, you were, you were out of the mix. Yeah. And so now all of a sudden you find these writers coming in who would like to create these 13 hour character arcs, much, much better than creating a two hour arc for television. And so you have this huge boom in dramatic television. That combined with these, and these platforms that have all of a sudden come up, not just, um, cable but internet and the yeah. plat and the cable ones have increased you know fx has announced they're going to do 25 series so yes on the whole i think and good writing by the way begets good directing so great directors are now coming into television if you look at the pilot season this year there were a bunch of directors who you would have never seen in television before including ang lee who just won the oscar right. and that gets you great actors so in this sense technology has improved the quality of television in our final session, we'll hear from a man who's reinvented television drama and comedy over a long and remarkable career. James L. Brooks is an Emmy and Academy Award-winning screenwriter, director, and producer who brought us shows like Taxi, The Mary Tyler Moore Show, and The Simpsons. In conversation with Kurt Anderson, Brooks talks about what TV shows can tell us about ourselves. So, Jim, if I may call you Jim. Please. Um, you, in, in your mid-20s, uh, before your mid late twenties, before you got into entertainment, you were a news guy. You were a journalist. That's how you started your career. Was that was that the intention? Was that going to be your life? No, so, so survival was the intention, and and I got I got very lucky, in terms of um, at that time to be part of CBS News at all, even on the lowest rung. You had to be to go to an elite school. I had I had one year of college, and but I would but I was on the page staff thanks to my uh, friend of my sister's. And then I filled in as a summer replacement for copy boys and newspapers, desk assistants at CBS, and the guy I replaced didn't come back. So I, so I got a job that you should go to an elite college to get. At, at this moment when not only network news, but CBS news I was the gold you're, lo you're looking at somebody who saw Edward R. Murrow in person. Really? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and did he say, hey, kid, you've got a future? Or? <laughs> he, 
He ignored he, you. He, he just, there, there's somebody who wrote, the, the person who wrote the great book about him, um, and I think spent 12 years doing it, and it's sort of amazing and thick, and they said, and somebody asked her on a show, what was the biggest surprise? And she said that he deserved a legend, and that's after 12 years. Yeah. And once you, though, stumbled with your one year of college into CBS News, d did you think that was just a, a, a job, but you would somehow get over into making entertainment? I, it was just stunning that I was there. It was just, it was just amazing. They used, to have, they used to have everybody's home phone numbers posted on a board in the newsroom. And I, I never called anybody, but I used to memorize those numbers really? and walk around knowing Cronkite. That I knew Edward R. Murrow's phone number. Yes. Can you still, do you still know <laughs> I, it? No, no, I'd be faking. I, I, I remember it well as when it premiered, and it was a big deal, Room 222. Yeah. And, and if, for those who don't remember it, it was, uh, it was, as I recall, both a comedy and a drama before the word dramedy had been coined. Yeah, it was, there was a, the, the producer director was Gene Reynolds, who later, who later did MASH and uh, later did Lou Grant with us. And, um, and he, he's one of the great men of television. And so we were doing, I think the second show, second half hour show certainly, starring an African American. And we were probably the first show with more than one African American in the cast in a prominent role. And there was a time of, you know, it was a time of great nervousness. And it took, it took Gene, who was ferocious in fighting for, I mean, at a time when it was really tough to fight the networks. I mean, that, it was never easy. But at that time, I think particularly There were so, only three of them. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And, give, and given, what, given the kind of show we were doing. And this is 1969 or so? Yeah. yeah. And, then we, and then the pilot episode was um, about, the, you know, and we... Gene, kept, Gene changed my life because he kept on insisting I do more research. I spent maybe half a year going every day to a Los Angeles high school, and he really? kept on sending me back, sending me back. And, then, and it was like medicine for me at the time, and now it's the only way I can work. So that really changed me. And, um, and, 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 and it's great because one of the things you get out of it is that you, you get to look at the constituency you're going to represent, and that, I think that really helps. With the Mary Tyler Moore show, which came when, you know, just exactly with the feminist movement. 1970. You know, where everybody wanted the wheel and we were experiencing that kind of pressure. Susan Silver, one of our writers, is here. Um, uh, we were slapping everybody's hands to keep them off the wheel, you know, of trying to make a statement about feminism with the show. Slapping writers' hands? Sla slapping, hands? Slapping, yeah. slapping you know, special interest hands, people coming in, you know, you know there was... Uh, who, who wanted that show to do their agenda, uh -huh. and we wanted to do the show we were doing, and, and, and we wanted to do our characters our way, which benefited from, you know, which had a sense of the time around us, and we got a lot of stories out of it. Uh, but that was, that was where, you know, including our own hands, not our agenda, that's not our thoughts. I, yeah. That's interesting, because you certainly, for a generation of people, men and women, I, you embodied it, you, you, you were it, rather than yeah. militating. Right? Yeah, yeah, and we got stories. We got stories because she lived in the time, she lived in those times. And does that, uh, th this last 15 years, this, this golden age, which is a commonplace but a true one, and, and taking place not entirely but almost entirely on cable, does that make you, uh, are, are you just, well, this is great, I love watching all these great shows, or do you itch to get back into it? Well, I, I, I'm really lucky because I'm never out of it because of The Simpsons. So I'm right. always, I'm always in a room. I'm always pitching. So well, and The Simpsons is an interesting case because I, I mean, again, as I think about the, his, the, the the modern history of television and and this golden age, I mean, 1989, the fact that it maintained its quality for, I mean, people argue online all the time about when it when it was great, as with all things that last a long time, but 24 years. I, 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 you know, I don't know another thing other than like on television, maybe 60 minutes. I mean, that, that has been good for that long. And weirdly, maybe there's a hunk of us who have been there from the start. Yeah. Weirdly. And uh, yeah. And, and I read that, that you at the very beginning, because you had, you know, some leverage uh, at when, when it began, you, you, you got a sort of unprecedented creative independence carve out from Fox? 
yeah, Barry Diller and I will always argue because, you know, the, the moment where I heard him say, no censorship, <laughs> you know, and then whenever, when we were really being watched, it became, you know, debatable on a few things. But, but we set very rigid rules, and I think, I think one of the things that contributes to the show is that when we dropped a rule, it just let us do a whole other kind of show. We, we had a, you know, we were very reality-based. We were crazy for two years not to reveal who did the voices. We wanted the characters. We, we went by, you know, we went by the same rules. We had done live-action shows, and we were rigid about it. And then we let that go a little. And then the show passed sort of from Bart being the star to Homer being the star. And then we say, okay, we're never going to show, do a show in space. We're going to be real enough. And then we went into, and then we went into space. And, and I think it's that kind of stuff. It's, it's, it's us putting up barriers that we then kick down. So you can then thereby evolve at your own pace. It's, and, it's freshening. It's yeah. freshening to say, let's do this. And, and it's something you didn't allow yourself to do a little while ago. But, I, but I'm really interested in this, in this uh, no censorship, creative independence, because it, I mean, uh, and that it was, by all appearances, uh, maintained. Uh, we, got we got tremendous support. We, uh, and it was a brand new network, and it was a network that was going broke and going bankrupt, and, and uh, you know, sort of, if, if executives can be heroic, it was during those days when, you know, when they were, <laughs> you know, running to pay bills, yeah. and then everything switched. Uh, Hollywood, uh, likes to say, as we've said today, that, oh, we've had a salutary effect on racial attitudes, on attitudes toward uh, gay people, and so forth. The, the, they like taking credit for the effects or putative effects that their shows and their movies have on, on doing good. But as soon as it comes to the question of, OK, what about your violent shows and your violent movies? Do those have them? No, 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 no. That has no effect on, on real life violence. C if one is true, doesn't the other have to be sort of true? Doesn't fictional depiction of violence have to have an effect? Entertainment Weekly just did a breakdown of the greatest television series. They just, somebody picked the greatest television series ever. And, uh, and I don't think anybody can argue with their first choice, which was The Wire. And that was, you know, one of the most violent shows in history. And so it, the conversation ends, doesn't it? The, the, you know, arguably the greatest television show ever made was an extremely violent show. Yeah. So after you stop that conversation with that, then then you're just having, if, are you trading on it? Is that what you you know? If is are you bad? Are you bad or good? Well, you can you, you can use the wire to say the argument ends. You can, but and let's get beyond television into movies. I mean, you, you, then, then the you wire in franchise in, in franchise characters that were real. Absolutely, who lived, I, in, who I, lived in violence, as I many agree. people as I, many people in this country do every day. I agree. Yeah, but but that's that's using the perfect and the best to to p potentially. I'm not saying there shouldn't be violent television. I'm just saying that poorly done, inuring people to the fun and thrill of violence is something that people who make those movies and shows have to cop to the possible effects as they're it's, copying to the possible it, effects of. It's uh, the issue is whether you're good or bad. From my point of view, I agree. Yeah, Justi I agree. justified is a violent show. It's brilliant. What about Walking Dead? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, as yeah. violent a show as there's ever been. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, but they're not quite people. You know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, the, the other thing they that sort people of explode in a, in a sort of colorful way. Yeah. I know, and I, I never thought a, a zombie show. I'm never going to watch that. I've watched every episode. So there you go. Um, uh, we, we talk, I mean, part of the, the subtext of this talk, I guess, is, is uh, uh, well, the, the text is what do shows television tell us about ourselves. What do, you know, now we have hundreds of channels and, and many, many reality shows that people love to hate, actually hate, the honey boo-boos and housewives of New Jersey's of the world. Does, does that tell us anything about ourselves, or is it just that there's so much more opportunity to turn over those rocks and see, see other lives? Uh, you know, I think uh, first of all, first of all, they, they, they tend to be the reality ones. would tend to be very dishonest and and you know and scripted, set up, yeah. And so so that's it, it's you know if they did it in a different business, they probably could be arrested, you know, <laughs> yeah. abroad. Um, so there's that. Uh, I think it's beneath the conversation. I don't know. I think if you start to argue about you know 
how bad crap is, you know, it's like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that smells bad. No, <laughs> yeah. no, let me look at this one. This smells <laughs> even worse. Um, uh, so as you say, you're still doing The Simpsons, but do you have a hankering to, to try to do your shot at the wire or? Uh, you know, I, 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 I sort of, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a tremendous fan of television, you know, so I watch it and, and I, and I, and you can't not know, you know, Mad Men is, uh, is sort of a, a miracle to me. Mad Men, if you talk about, what, what's the question that, that I, it keeps confusing me? Why do what TV, do TV shows, shows tell, us tell us about ourselves? ourselves? So Mad Men. That we used to smoke and drink and have <laughs> affairs a lot, I guess. But Mad Men will hit, you know, can, can do loads of story, which involves you as much as story can involve you, or they'll do just an existential show. And, and I don't know who said it, it would be great if it was me, but I don't think it was. Um, uh, that, 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 the, that one of the purposes of popular culture is to let people know they are not alone and to see yourself reflected in something truthfully. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll go back. Uh, the purposes yeah. of fiction, not just popular culture, all, much of art, I would argue, is exactly that. Mm -hmm. Certainly that's, I mean, why else I does one read novels? But television has this thing of, you know, which it's not quite as much anymore of being the watering hole where all the animals come out of the forest and they see each other only when they, you know, when there's a show which everybody watches. But what, but, and that's, an, that's a huge and interesting change from, you know, you know there's lots of uh, uh, sounds of agreement about Mad Men when you mention it, but it has audiences of two million, three million people. You but had audi but, you, but, and, and, and it's irrelevant. Because, you had audiences because, of 20 and 30 million people and more. Yeah. So that a lot fewer animals coming to individual water accounts. <laughs> um, sure. Hey there. Um, what do you think of the of binge viewing and how that has changed storytelling? When I talk about binge viewing, sort of the, the house of cards model where people will take an entire 13 episodes, watch it all at one time, uh, what that does to sort of the collective water cooler issue that you talked about earlier, but, but most importantly, the storytelling issue of how you actually tell a story if people are going to sit and watch all of it at one shot. Well, there's no better question. I mean, because that's, that, that's the revolution we're having now. The water cooler is, is much less important. It's, it's an individual being able to select whatever they want at any time. I did The Wire on a binge. I think it was 60 shows, something like that. And, I, and it was a, so it's a, it was a real binge, and it's and 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 it's a different experience, um, and I think it's a richer experience. I think you know when you're surrounded by it, when you when when you go to sleep and wake up and experience it again, and that happens again and again. So if a show is so you can you can immerse yourself in it, you can become part of it. I mean it's it's. It's like, it's like when there's great literature, you know, what a reader brings to it, when they're that immersed in it, when the book starts to have an effect on them. So it's, yeah, there's a very different trip that is becoming a very common trip, I think, and I think it's going to, it's changing everything. There have been several references to this as the golden age of television, and I wonder if you could just talk for a minute about what, what do you think are the circumstances that have made that possible? Um... I think, remember the 70s movies? You know, golden age of American movies, I think by, you know, I think most people would agree on that, those 10 years. And then movies stopped reaching for that. I mean, the, always the heartbeat's true, always somebody will be doing a great film at some time, always you can't stop it. But movies no longer have it as their, at all, their reason for existing, at all. And so I think that sort of shoved people, sh shoved, shoved people towards television. And, um, and, I, and, and you have, you have in, in movies, you know, how many outlets are there for, you know, uh, uh, movies empower director to a, to a tremendous degree. Television empowers writers to a tremendous degree. So I would, I would say that's, that's a reason too. And, it, and, and, as, and as people are continually rewritten in movies and it's common to see so many different names on a screenplay, uh, as it goes through that, that happens, very, you know, in television, there, there tends to be a writer in charge of the show that, that you know, so that, so that doesn't happen. So, so, and television is interested in a, in, a, in a new voice, in a new writing voice, even though it's, even though maybe at the end of it, it's niche. Independent movies still do that. Movies will always do it some. Television 
there, there, there are whole networks, cable networks of television that are devoted to pursuit of excellence because it's where they make their money. I think that's why. And because, right, they've, they've found that they can make a profitable show with 2 million, 3 million, 4 million, 5 million people watching, which wasn't the case. James L. Brooks has brought us memorable television over his long career, and we hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Aspen Institute Presents. We'll be back tomorrow night on World Channel with more from the final day of the Aspen Ideas Festival. You can also watch live video online at aspenideas.org or see more episodes of the Aspen Institute Presents on worldchannel.org. And then join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter. I'm John Stewart. Thanks for watching the Aspen Institute Presents.